Thorsten Wendes, der die Besetzung war. Okay, hi everyone. How's everyone doing today? Um, yeah, it's my first time here at Carousel. Um, I have some friends around here, but maybe not on here today. Yeah, so um, today I'm just presenting like what I have done you know, using my ESP32. So who here has actually used the ESP32 to actually know, you know like what it does? You can raise your hands. Okay. Yeah, not many, so I think this will be kind of uh, informative for you guys. Right, so a bit about myself. Um, I'm basically based in the US. I work for a teleconferencing company. Um, what I usually do, I eat, sleep, and code, right? Don't really have much other things, but you know, in the day, my day job is like a back end engineer. Um, but I also, I also do a lot of uh, distributed systems, custom services. Um, but personally, my hobby, I really like to make stuff because, like, Making stuff allows you to explore like many other dimensions, and not just software, but also um, mechanical, electrical. You get to see your code interact with real life, right? You get to see, you know, blink lights, move um, motors, or stuff like that, right? And essentially, the core of it is really like you want to solve real problems that you face in life. Like for example, you know, if um, like you want some more automation, you can just use the ESP32 and build something that turns on, on and off your lights, right? So, some of my other projects, um, I've done a lot of things, mostly circuit boards, circuit boards, some hardware um, stuff, laptop mounts, and some woodworking sometimes, you know, like because woodworking allows you to use your hands, right? You don't really use your hands to build stuff, you're always stuck in the flat 2D screen, it's um, only like two dimensional. And you, yeah, I also did some like uh, audio experiments into analog electronics. I work with, uh, basically, it's like a two, two channel mixer. Yeah, but just for fun. Right, so first question, right, is why do you do this? You can buy so many different things out there. But the problem is that many of these things are well, more expensive, it costs like a few hundred bucks USD, not Singapore dollars. Right, and um, they are usually for doors, right? They're not for suitable for, let's say, you want to, you know, uh, put a latch on uh, a cupboard, a cabinet, uh, a locker, I don't know. Right, so. The backstory is, yeah, most the backstory is that you know I wanted to have a, have a lock in Singapore, right? My parents, you know, they uh, they don't really have like much smart things at home, so I just thought like, okay, maybe you try to use the door lock, right? Um, I looked at all the, all the locks out there. I had to like import it from the US. Uh, most of them are closed source. I can't exactly have my own APIs to connect to them. Um, many of the APIs are dependent on the provider's server. So what happens if one day the provider goes away, right? I'm going to the user's piece of white element, right? And also, I don't know, I have root access, so I do not like it, right? I like to be in control of my devices. But I think at the core of it is that I just want to practice doing and making stuff, whether it's 3D printing, uh, design circuit boards. It's just practicing because in the past when I used to build things, I think a really long time, I think that was like 10, 10 years ago, right? But the more you do it, the more time to iterate through it, your methods improve. Maybe you used to take like 10 hours to design a circuit board, right? After 10 years now, I probably take like an hour, right? And it's really fast. So, when we design something, like if you try to build this door lock out of ESP32, yeah, at first it is a toy, it's an experiment. I just want to know that how hard, really how hard is it to make something like this? You don't know until you really want to try it. You do it yourself and you figure out all the problems, right? You have a working reference design. And in future, let's say, you know, okay, I want to customize this lock. Maybe I don't need a pin pad. I want to change the locking mechanism, right? I just take the same design, I copy, paste, edit it. I send out the fabrication and I have something working to suit my use case. Right, so it's just it's just really efficient. If you have something that you've done before, it's easy to just take what you've done before to cater to a specific use case. So the design goal, okay, of this thing over here, I put it in front. Later you guys can come and take a look. I'll probably open it up, um, but when I open it up, I'm not sure if the wires will short or anything. <laughs> it's just a prototype, so I just squeeze everything together, you know, no custom circuit boards or anything. Yeah. So the design goal here yes, has a bolt latch, right? It's a bolt latch. Um, it has a key to lock and unlock it manually if you run out of battery. Um, it has a pin pad, a LCD, and it uses Wi-Fi. The, there's no requirement that it needs to be battery operated because personally, I really do not like battery operated things. I hate replacing batteries. 
but that's another story to tell. <laughs> right, and so the back story you know, is that um, one year ago, so this project is that one year ago, I just completed it like last week. Okay, and so the story is this, right? One year ago, I acquired a Nano 32, um, and I wanted to do this door lock thing, you know, and I went to find Fazli from Jogi, and I basically go down to his office and I say, hey, I need this list of parts, right? And in Singapore, if you need a list of parts, like, available, to be available, you can go to Simon Tower, but the parking there is horrendous, right? So I'd rather go to, like, Fazli's place, you know, and dig through his whole bunch of stuff. He sells off the, the older, uh, what do you call it, the older parts, right? And, uh, Low cost, right? So I just go there, link it in stuff, get um, all those like things like buzzers, um, LCDs, so on and so forth, right? And I try to put it together. Now, everything seems to be going well until I start doing like, you know, the uh, Wi Fi reliability test. I did a loop, I did an API call, you know, a, a HTTPS call to my server. I did it in a loop because I want to see that how reliable is this like ESP32, right? I want to test the module itself. and. It turns out that it keeps breaking, it keeps hanging. So this, this, this is primarily the reason why this project was like last year and I did not touch it for a really long time. Okay, so it's like, yeah, it was, it keeps hanging, it keeps giving uh, the typical ESP32 crash traces. And I was like, okay, you know, this is not going well, uh, maybe one side for a long time. And one day I finally figured out, okay, I'll just click this, buy this other ESP32 module on Amazon and like, Hey, it's not my code. My code actually works. It's fine. It's that silly module that is faulty. So yeah, you know, like what gaming experience just now, you try all kinds of things and figure out that <laughs> it's a silly cable. Over here is a silly module, right? <laughs> so lesson learned, you know, I should have a whole range of ESP32 models just to try. If it doesn't work, just toss it out, try a new one. Your time is probably more valuable than you trying to, you know, fix those things. So just two weeks earlier, um, I got down to piecing it together. Um, I actually did some tests a long time ago, but you know, just two weeks ago that I tried I built a 3D printed case around it because there's really nothing much to present if it's just like pieces of electronics wired together, right? So I got a common cheap uh, key latch, some cheap I2C LCDs. Um, I didn't want to use parallel LCDs because the ESP32 had so few pins, right? And um, just other things lying around, spring, servo, keypad, and the beeper. Yeah, so one of the first things when you get all your parts is that you want to see how they fit together mechanically, right? You, so one of the cheap, all the cheap codes or like the, the quick hacks that I like to do is that I'll go online, Google, find all the CAD drawings of things, of commonly used things, right? Like, you know, I use like a top Power Pro, like 995 servo. Just Google it, you'll find it, download, throw it in your 3D software, see if it fits. Don't waste time trying to use your vernier calipers or whatever, taking measurements. You know, someone has done it for you, just upload it, just use it, right? Same thing for I2C LCD, just download, just use it. <laughs> Throw into whatever CAD software you have, just import STL file. The dimensions should be right. I mean, you can do some preliminary measurements, you know, to see that, oh, you know, is, is this source trustworthy? But, you know, like, if you go to the, this website, like, I think this is from uh, Grab CAD, Grab CAD, C -A -D, not taxi, right? And you'll actually be able to uh, see that there are some models where many people have downloaded, so I just pick the most popular one. You, it must be right. <laughs> Yeah, and so you throw in your CAD software, you cut it out, um, and so this is more or less a like B2B diagram, I just took a screenshot, and yeah, that, yeah, after I printed it out, I realized some problems, like, you know, the LCD mount wasn't exactly perfect because I thought the model was wrong, um, it's probably my inch to millimeter conversion is screwed up, I'm not exactly used to inches nor millimeters, I always use a lot of math to try to convert it and do it wrongly, yeah, and on the bottom left side is this bolt. The bolt needs to move like left and right. So you know, I just put like two pins over there to prevent rotation. And um, of course the next step I have to go and figure out where to print it, right? I mean I, I have like two old 3D printers at home. Um, they are not working because 3D printers apparently need maintenance and I do not have time <laughs> to maintain. Yes. So my good friend at Google, uh, after I bugged him a bit, Right, he brought me in. So Google has this cool thing where there are 3D printers, um, you know, are essentially available for public for use, but you know, you need a friend to bring you in. Right. And, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, apart from free meals, which is great. And basically, as went there, I spent about um, one and a half days printing it out over there, um, overnight, which isn't a good idea, which I'll explain why. But it's really nice. Like, um, there's this uh, duplicator i3. I think it is easy to use. 
the settings are all there. I just upload the uh, G code, right? Export STL, upload the G code, follow step by step instructions, and it prints well, right? So that's a good start. And first piece that came out, yeah, it's great. It's just the boat which has a little incline there. It needs a little slope just because then, you know, when you close the door, you want the boat to slide in. Okay. Um, yeah, all these nothing much. I printed out the case, it turned out great, except that there were some cracks. This was printed overnight where temperature fell to, I think, from like 16 to 5. So I don't, I don't think ABS really liked that now. Of course, I also got some advice from Shunwei to, uh, on like, you know, what could possibly have caused this. So yeah, in future, I'll take note of the ambient temperature. Um, I printed out the, the base. Right, which has all those standoffs for you know to screw on outer case, to mount the, to the servo. Yeah, so I was pretty happy that this turned out well because I had worse three printing experience in the past where I end up with a bowl of plastic spaghetti. Um, yeah, and I was quite pleased that I could just like tap I happen to have an entry tap lying around, I just grabbed it and said, okay, I'll just use this instead of self-tapping screws and just tap the holes for it and put it together and yeah, it was pretty straightforward. One thing that I did not control is that I did not know it. at that point I didn't know how to attach the servo to the boat, you know, and the key lock was kind of like manually positioned. So yeah, a bit of like duct tape and uh, the double sun tape, three and tape. But those are really useful, you know. If you have like three and tape, just stock it up here. It sticks anything anywhere most of the time. Yeah. Um, that spring it was supposed to be a small spring, but I didn't want to cut the spring with pliers. You know, it's really hard to cut steel spring. Uh, you probably end up damaging it, so I just left it as it is, and it works. <laughs> yeah, so I finally assembled it. I put the pin pad on the on the surface. The key actually works. The key lock actually works great because the measurements are right. So well, once the hardware has been assembled, right, the next step, the next two things left are electrical and software. Right, for software, I was thinking that you know we want to control it over. An online method. I love to use Firebase. I treat use Firebase and many other competitions before, uh, not competitions, hackathons, because it's so easy, you know, to like communicate between apps and other software, right? And yeah, it's essentially this. I'm going to show a demo later. And I actually created an open source, a private, fi private Firebase server clone, which I'll talk at a different talk. I think it's on the 21st of February. Uh, not confirmed yet. Yeah. And this is the, so ESP32, you know, there are so many different modules out there. I just googled it, I think most of them follow this pinout over here. So ESP32, the nice thing is that there is like two cores. There are two cores running at 40 megahertz. It is faster than a 46 maybe, you know, maybe you want to try running Linux on this thing. Okay, this is faster. Of course, it has two cores. I'll explain why later, that's very important, right? I will run through this very quickly because connecting up electronics is very straightforward for a hacker prototype. Yeah, if you are going to try to do things like deep sleep, um, you probably need to do some additional wiring. So because you have two cores, right? So where I'm not going to run through Arduino code because that's super boring. I use Arduino because it's easy, right? But by right, I will be using something else in future. Um, I'll explain why later. But synchronization is important when you have two CPUs, right? Um, typically, your API calls are going to be blocking. What, I, what that means is that when you try to make an API call, that CPU is busy doing it. You can't do anything else. So you have to use both cores if you're going to do API calls with uh, maybe you know, polling of hardware, like scanning the keypad or moving the uh, updating LCD by I square C, etc. Right. And one of the basic important things is that when you want to debug code, we typically do a printout. If you print out um, from two cores at the same time, you're going to get a bunch of like garbage or mashed up stuff on screen. So you have to synchronize it. We use a spin lock to synchronize it. Um, and because there's two cores, this is how I allocate the task. Right? One core is purely for um, doing the communications over Wi-Fi. The other core will basically be handle the low-level stuff like you know, scanning the keypad. Yeah. Um, and because it's, you notice that it's actually, essentially a real-time operating system, you can create more than one task. Uh, but you have to make sure that you allocate time for the tasks to be executed. If you have a while one loop, your CPU is going to be busy doing it and it's not going to switch over to the other task automatically. You have to give it time. You have to add delays and add the yield, call the yield command um, you know, sufficiently, frequ sufficiently frequent or else 
they will not switch tasks. Right, okay, so uh, time for a demo. <laughs> yes. I hope nothing is shorter, but so essentially this is like a uh, block over here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can bring the camera in. So what this lock does is that you know, it's very similar to many other locks out there. It has a pin pad, LCD, it has a latch over here, right? It's spring loaded, so let's say if you close the door, it's going to just like, you know, it's going to slip in like this. Yeah, right. And let's say you want to open it, um, you just enter the pin code. The pin code is actually updated online over Firebase. Yeah. So if the correct pin code is open, then the lock will be retracted and you, know, you could open the door. Um, I can try to switch over to Firebase here. This, this uh, Firebase console here is basically raw data. I basically have my multiple pins entered. Um, the first pin is always fixed, but the rest of the pins are single use pins where once you use it, it will just be removed from the database. Okay, you can see that when the lock moves, when someone tries to lock or unlock, the status will be updated on the console over here. And if you update the console, um, it will also eventually update the physical lock. It's good through my 3G, so uh, the reaction is kind of slow. Okay, let's uh, try to run this up. Okay, so I actually have videos here as well, you know, in case I ever upload uh, Slides online, you guys can watch it as well. well. Okay, so there are some gotchas that I ran into when using this thing. Apparently, there are some pins on the ESP32 that are input only. And when I mean input only, they do not have internal pull ups or downs. So, yeah, I have to do some of my last minute um, changing of pins to scan you know, for the keypad. Right. And uh, the watchdog doesn't work on the uh, from Arduino ID because it apparently is. Kind of like disabled. Um, it is automatically called whenever you run through the loop, the loop function. So in future, if you're going to like uh, use this for your own projects in sufficiently advanced, you probably want to like use the uh, use the ESP32 IDF library by itself. Also, you know, HTTPS is not exactly very fast. There are better protocols out there if you need better real-time communications like MQTT, raw TCP, etc. Yeah, so apparently, obviously, you know, I, there are many things that uh, I have not actually put in, right? Like, um, there's no way to actually set the SSID or currently, right? It's kind of like hard coded, but by right, I could use like various methods using the microphone or the LDR, put it up to your phone, the website flashes some signals and, you know, it recognizes. Um, deep sleep, yes, there's totally no power saving, so if you try to run this off batteries, it probably wouldn't last uh, a week, right? Of course, there's, a, there's no watchdog because, as I mentioned, it's disabled Arduino. Um, without the watchdog, the problem is that if you ever have like a bug in the code or your Wi-Fi locks up, you need some way to hard reset it. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, and that's all. Over here, you guys, um, later you guys can come over here, I can dis disassemble it. If you guys want to have a closer look, my details up there, you know, um, follow my Instagram, I frequently post about fun stuff that I do over there. Uh, so, that's all. Thank you.